Welcome to Eastlake. We are an inclusive faith community dedicated to the free search for truth and meaning, seeking to live out a more just and life-giving spirituality in the modern world. We see faith as less about doctrines and dogmas demanding total agreement, but a life to be lived, enjoyed, and given away to others. What unites us is a growing awareness that life is a gift and love is the point. We welcome the entire human family, regardless of race, age, creed, physical abilities, marital or economic status, gender identity, or sexual orientation. So if you are curious and have come to see, if you are tired and have come to rest, if you are grateful and have come to share, if you are journeying and have come to grow, if you are wounded and have come to heal, if you are joyful and have come to shine, welcome home. Today, we hear from Jamal Rahman as he continues our series, Beauty and Wisdom. Please check the description for links to our quarterly Spotify playlist and guided meditation. My dear friends, I am absolutely delighted to be back again. Last week, I talked about Islam and Sufism, which is dated uh, six centuries after the birth of Christ. And today, I shall talk about Buddhism, which is six centuries before the birth of Christ. You know, I'm a Muslim. I'm rooted in Islam, but I'm open to the beauty and wisdom of other traditions. And I love particularly to study uh, Buddhism. Uh, you might say my major is Islam and my minor is Buddhism. And by studying Buddhism and other traditions, it waters my Islamic roots, nourishes my Islamic roots, and makes me a better Muslim and a more developed human being. Which is why we say interfaith is not about conversion. It is about completion becoming a more developed, complete human being. So I really encourage you, if you have a religion, also be open to studying other religions. If you don't have any faith, any religion, just be open to receiving the insights and practices of other traditions. So, Buddhism. How can I start with that? Um, maybe I should just... Um, relate a few stories, a couple of stories, just to give you a sort of a, a sense, a flavor of this particular beautiful faith. The story is of two monks, and it's a stormy, windy day, and a flag is fluttering in the wind, and one monk is saying, the wind is moving. The other monk says, no, the banner, the flag is moving. They argue. They go to a, a greater sage and he says, you're both wrong. The mind is moving. The mind. This is very critical in getting to the essence of Buddhism. Another story, again, two monks, they have a particular destination to go to. Uh, They're uh, traveling along and now they come to a stream and have to cross the stream. And on the one bank is a, is a woman with a beautiful silken dress. And she says, you know, uh, this dress of mine, if I wade in the stream, it'll soil the dress. Do you mind just carrying me and dropping me off on the other side? And one monk immediately picks her up, crosses the stream and places it down gently and they proceed on the journey. But the other monk says, to the monk who carried that woman across the stream, brother, don't we have vows of chastity? You touched a woman. You broke your vows, how could you? The other monk says nothing, they move along. Again, he starts, you touched her. You've broken the vows. Doesn't say anything. Happens a third time. Then this time the other monk says, brother, yes, I touched her and I dropped her on the other side of the stream, but you, you are still carrying her. 
not able to let go. Just be with that. And what brings this brings up for me is a wonderful uh, scriptural saying by the Buddha who says, we are what we think. Everything that we are arises with our thoughts. With our thoughts, we make our world. Speak and act with a pure mind and happiness will follow you as the wheel follows the oxen cart. Speak and act with an impure mind and unhappiness, sorrow, will follow you as your shadow follows you. So once again, become aware of the importance of thoughts, our thinking. Just be with that for a few seconds. Okay, now the story of the Buddha. Who was the Buddha? He was a very protected prince, meaning his father was overprotective of a prince who was born in, today it's called Nepal, it was India at that time, in northern India, a Hindu. And his father, a very uh, powerful monarch, as I said, was very protective and made sure that his son, uh, did not experience the, the difficulties of life. Everything around him was very beautiful. And when uh, the Buddha was young, he, had, he was married, had a small son, he managed to sneak out of the palace walls uh, with a charioteer. And for the first time, he saw a few things. These are called the four passing sights. And as I mentioned these four passing sights, in your heart ask yourself, what are some passing sights in my life that splashed in my heart, that resonated, made me ask questions, deeper questions? So what was the first sight? Uh, for the first time, the Buddha saw outside the palace gates an old, frail person, and he was quite shocked. The other passing sight was he saw a person who was quite unwell, very sick, suffering. And that really touched him and it brought up a lot of feelings and questions. The third passing sight was a corpse. He saw a dead person. He had never seen a dead body. It really shook him. The fourth passing sight was he met a monk who ex uh, manifested what the Buddhists call equanimity. What does that exactly mean? Well, let me symbolize it. It's like, it's like in, in life you are, metaphorically, in the center of the wheel. The wheel goes up, the wheel goes down, that's life. But you are in the center of the wheel. You're perturbed, but not overly perturbed when difficult things happen. When exciting, wonderful things happen, uh, you're happy, but not overly excited. Uh, you know, a, a story comes to mind. Uh, my, my, one of my favorite stories, on a moonlit night, a monk's house is burned to the ground. What does a monk do? Simply look at the moon and say, ah, oh, finally, a perfect view of the moon at night. That's equanimity. I ask myself, I ask you, do we have in our lives that sense, that vibration of equanimity? Okay, back to the four passing sights. So by this time, the Buddha began to ask a lot of questions, difficult questions from those passing sights. But the main question was, why would a mother want to give birth to a child who would grow old, become sick inevitably, and then 
die. It just made no sense to him. Why would a mother want to do that? And this question disturbed him so much, or it brought up so many other questions, that he had this unquenchable thirst to know why, why, why would a mother want to give birth to such a child who would grow old, become sick, and die? Such was the force of this question that he actually left his kingdom to find answers. He went into the forests of India and met those gurus, swamis, wise people who meditated on, on these questions, uh, were enlightened. And he asked them these questions, hoping to get answers which would satisfy him. After seven long years, he found no answer. And in desperation, one day he sat down under a fig tree called the Bodhi tree, which still exists in India. People go on pilgrimage to visit that tree. And he sat under the, under the tree and said, I shall not get up from this tree until the answers come to me. This is symbolic of something very profound that the deepest of answers is really within ourselves. We don't know on which night or which morning, but something burst forth from him. And that not only make him, made him enlightened, but provided a message for himself and for the world. That's called the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. And he realized if one understands the Four Noble Truths, follows the Eightfold Path, one can become freed, enlightened. Okay, so in Buddhism, it is good to study those, and I shall mention those, but just pause right now and just take in what I've said, those deeper questions. And as I mentioned the Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Path, see how it applies to your life. So what is the First Noble Truth? The First Noble Truth is, can I, can I accept the fact that there is Dukkha, suffering in this world. Another word is dissatisfaction. It's bound to happen. Our parents have died or will die. There is suffering. So many other things happen. Can I accept that? Number two is called tanha, meaning desire. And this is the cause of our suffering. The cause of our suffering is our attachment to things of the created world. The Buddha famously said, the rain could turn to gold, and yet this would not quench our thirst. Another verse I remember, of my life, our life is like, you're like a hunted hare or rabbit. The pursuer of desire pursued, harried from life to life to life. The pursuer of desire pursued. The cause of suffering is our attachment to things of the created world. Okay, third noble truth. Ah, there's good news. And the fourth noble truth, the good news is if you follow the Eightfold Path, you shall be freed. You see, this is on the goals in Buddhism. Like in Christianity, it's salvation. In Islam, it's surrender. In the Eastern traditions, it's you want to be freed. It's called moksha or mukti. Okay, now let's look at the 
Eightfold Path. The first one is right understanding. Can I have a higher understanding of everything around me in my life? Can I grow from my experiences? Everything in the created world changes. Everything is impermanent. When I become attached to it and it changes, I suffer. I become dissatisfied. My ego wants more money, more titles. Of course, there's no end to what I want, but also whatever I want changes. There is form and there is essence. There is pleasure and there is bliss. I want more money. This is the form. It's fine, we all want more money. But why do I want more money? I want more security, more freedom, more love. I make more headway, more doors open up if I focus more on essence rather than form. Form is impermanent. There is pleasure and there is bliss. The Buddha says, forgo pleasure so you might attain bliss. You deserve bliss. You know, I'm reminded of this, uh, actually it's a Hindu story, of a true story of Ramakrishna, a, a 19th century mystic, a, a beautiful rural mystic who would burst in, in those British days when the British ruled India, he would enter into these liquor stores and tell all those people who were drunk or buying liquor, he said, you know, what you are wanting, what you're doing is very beautiful. You want to have that feeling of getting drunk. You're on the right track. But I, I beg you, get drunk on real wine. He would rush into those perfume or parfumery stores where they sell perfume. He would say, it's beautiful that you want uh, to experience that beautiful fragrance. But I beg you, go deeper, go deeper. Experience and go wild with real fragrance. There's pleasure, there is bliss. Something is form, something is essence. I'm reminded of actually a Muslim saying of, by, of Rumi, the 13th century sage, and he says, Jesus was drunk, intoxicated by love of God. And his donkey was drunk on barley. So just be with that. Right understanding. Okay, next one is right aspiration. Do I have the appropriate aspiration? Am I looking for things in the right direction? Am I hankering after, pursuing in my life uh, this is the title of a story, The Real Gem. So the story is, this is in several traditions. This is a Buddhist version. Uh, the monk, you know, they love to serve people. They don't have time to cook food. So when they want food, they just knock on a householder's door and the householder is very delighted to give food because they will gain merit in uh, next world. And one particular monk goes to this particular house and happens to be the house of a jeweler. Of course, he's delighted to bring food, but as the monk opens his sparse pouch, the jeweler, the householder, is astonished. He says, I'm a jeweler. Uh, I, I see this beautiful stone in your sparse pouch. That's a very rare jewel. It's worth a few million dollars. And he says, where did you get it? And the monk who has equanimity says, oh, I kind of remember uh, five years ago, a disciple gave it to me. He says, that is just the most incredibly valuable, precious stone I've ever seen, millions of dollars worth. And suddenly the monk says, do you want it? Of course not, it belongs to you. The monk says, I know. That is why I'm 
taking this and giving it to you. I want to give it to you. Another monk goes away and the jeweler is so excited. His life has changed, life of his children, grandchildren, but now the questions. Should I tell my wife about this? Of course, she's my wife, I love her. But my wife has this, sis, has her sister who is so gossipy. The entire village will know I'll be in trouble. Should I hire guards? Of course, I must hire guards. This is so valuable. But if I hire guards, people will know I'm guarding something very precious. Maybe I should not hire guards, but it will be stolen. Should I? Should I not? Should I tell IRS about this or not? Question after question after question. And he gets no satisfaction. On the 10th day, when he couldn't sleep a wink, he gets a another insight. He grabs that jewel and he runs after asking, where is that monk? Where is that monk? And after a journey of two or three days, he finally finds the monk and says, monk, monk, please take this gem back. But give me the real gem. The real gem? And the jeweler says, yes, I realize the, the real gem is the ease, the peace, the equanimity with which you're able to part and give away this precious stone to me. That is the real gem. That is what I aspire to in my life. So it's a very good, for me, a very good story to reflect on I ask myself, Jamal, in, in your life, have you, are you pursuing the real gem? Be with that for a few seconds. Okay, let's move on. Right speech. Please, the Buddha would say, don't think words are inconsequential. They have vibrations. They have power. Be mindful of your speech. You know, in the Islamic tradition, this 14th century sage Hafiz says, and I always remember that, he says, words become the house you live in. Choose your words carefully. Along those lines, the Buddha says, please do not gossip. And please do not listen to gossip. That's part of right speech. And one of his beautiful verses is, dwelling on your brother's or sister's faults. Dwelling on your brother's or sister's faults multiplies your own. Just be with that for a few moments. Okay, the next one is right effort. So rather than me use too many words, just ponder on this contrast. You have this hamster in a cage, just running back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But does that mean it's being productive? Is it making the right effort? Is mere motion the right effort? Well, it can be, but not always. Contrast that with a hen sitting silently on an egg. You might say it's doing nothing, but it's being very productive. Ask yourself, am I engaged in the right effort? I'll turn this page of my notes. Okay, next one is right conduct. Of course, you know, uh, like other traditions uh, in Buddhism, uh, do not kill, do not lie, uh, do not be unchaste. Do not steal, do not use intoxicants, 
and so like other traditions and I, I like this very much because this is uh, for me it similar in Islam uh, the, the Buddha says do this work of purifying yourself little by little like a silversmith sifts dust from silver little by little remove your impurities and I love the saying of the Buddha uh, when he says do not make light of your failings saying they're nothing a jug fills up drop by drop and soon the fool becomes brimful of folly at the same time uh, do not belittle your virtues a jug fills up drop by drop by drop and in good time the wise person becomes brimful of virtues so yes work on your what is called right conduct to purify yourself to become more christ-like buddha-like allah-like elohim-like little by little by little okay next one is right livelihood it really matters what career you're engaged in. The Buddha had this saying that the hand of the dyer, D-Y-E-R, is subdued in the dye it is placed in. So for example, if I say I'm a pacifist, I'm against war, but I'm working in a part of Boeing that makes armaments, that does not tally with my deepest values. If I say I'm very much for earth care, I'm so sad about this planetary degradation, pollution, etc., etc., but I work at an institution that pollutes the air, it's okay, it's just a job I'm doing. The Buddha says that's not going to work. Those vibrations, they affect you. The next one is right meditation, going into silence. Do you practice silence? I'm asking you and asking myself because in Buddhism that is very critical. You know, I'm thinking as I'm pausing, I'm thinking uh, what really has convinced me to practice silence uh, particularly uh, those words of Rumi, silence is not the absence of sound, it's the absence of the little self. Silence is the language of God. Everything else is a poor translation. Once the, uh, uh, the, the Buddha was asked, uh, what do you gain from silence, meditation? And the Buddha answered, nothing at all. I gained nothing at all. And they were so surprised, shocked. Why do you make us meditate for so many, you know, hours and hours? And Buddha said, let me tell you what I have lost. I have lost my anger, my anxiety, my depression, my fear of death, fear of old age. That is why I meditate. So yes, please. Create some space in your life to regularly, daily if possible, to go into a, even a short period of pure silence. Okay, one more in the Eightfold Path is right mindfulness. My life could be so absorbed by a, a regret of the past and anxiety about the future. I'm not in the present moment. I'm missing out on the now. And how, how, how does one explain the beauty, the majesty of being in the present moment? And of course, I repeat this every time. Uh, the same story, here's the Buddhist version. A, a monk has a toothache. If you, have, if you had a toothache, you'll know how difficult it feels. And the monk says, if only this toothache went away, I'd be so happy. 
Then he turns to his fellow monks who are unhappy and says, do you have it too thick? Do you have it too thick? Do you have it too thick? Why aren't you happy? It's because you don't realize this very moment is a non toothache moment. So maybe learn some techniques of being in the present moment. It does not mean that I cannot learn from the past or plan for the future. As I've said maybe in my earlier video, that it means that if I go in the past or in the future, I am present in the past. I am present in the future. It could be as simple as me giving myself permission. So whenever I want to look in the past, I always say, Brother Jamal, I say it with compassion, I'm giving you permission to regret something in the past. Maybe just five, ten minutes. I say, come back in the present moment. Or I say, Brother Jamal, I notice you're worrying so much about something which hasn't even happened in the future. I tell you what, Brother Jamal, uh, let's have 20 minutes worrying as much as you want to. But 20 minutes are over, I come back into the present moment. That wonderful, still living Buddhist teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, he says, the miracle is not to walk on water. The miracle is to walk on land. So what practices can you be doing? Could I be doing? For me, what works is I do self-talk. If I find myself not being in the present moment, I say, Brother Jamal, come on. A, a Sufi or a, or a spiritual Muslim is a son or daughter, if, it, if it's a woman. I'm, in this case, a, a Sufi is a son of the present moment. Come on, let's come back in the present moment. I do it with compassion. The Buddha was asked, Lord Buddha, what is your technique? He said, whenever I find myself not being present, I take a few moments, could be a few seconds, could be longer time. I close my eyes, I focus on my nostril, and I'm just present with my breath. And this brings me back in the present moment. Some like to touch their body. That brings them back in the present moment. Some like to play music. If you're playing music, you are present. But you have to find for yourself a technique that brings you back into the now. Okay, uh, bringing it to a close, there is another very important aspect. There's several aspects called right community. It's so important, it's outside of the Eightfold Path, has a separate section of its own. And the story is that once the Buddha's secretary, also was his cousin, was telling the Buddha that, uh, Lord Buddha, from your talks it seems that half of one's enlightenment uh, depends on right association. And the Buddha raised his voice, he said, Ananda, you're wrong, 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 not half, all of it. 100% depends on right association. So besides practicing silence in Buddhism, having a Sangha, or what is called a community, sacred community, is very critical. So the, the, the assembly of monks gathered and said, tell us more, tell us more. And among, among other things he said, his famous words are, find friends who love the truth. And this is in every tradition that have this, what uh, I call, meaning because Sufis call it, circle of love in your life. What is a circle of love? Well, who can I invite into my circle of love? Well, three gateways. There is love. There is trust. Because without vulnerability, there's no community. You've heard this many times. The third one is there's a love of truth. Create that in your life. And that will really serve you. Because what is life about? It's about becoming a better human being. In the case of a Buddhist or a, the Buddhist teaching, connecting with the Buddha nature, your trusted friends could be from family, from your circle of friends. They can help you by telling you the truth where you need to improve, 
where you're doing very well. So a community can help you in becoming a better evolved human being, in being of service. They can really, you, together you can collaborate in some projects and interact with others. And about service, uh, I want to say the words of Dalai Lama who says, you know, when you join a sacred community and you're being serviced, he says, always please help others. And if you cannot help others, I beg you, please do not hurt them. So about community, the Buddha has a saying, he says, follow the shining ones, the ones who are loving, the ones who are wise, the ones who are awakened in different stages. Follow them as the moon follows the path of the stars. My friends, I hope some of these insights help you. Now let me quickly end. I'm looking at the time. Uh, I've gone over my time. How shall I end? You know, the Buddha was always asked, uh, Lord Buddha, are you like a god, an angel, a wizard? And he would always answer, no, I am simply awake. I am simply awake. You see, the Buddha, that's not his real name. His, name, his real name is uh, Siddhartha Gautama. Buddha uh, comes from the word Buddha, both in Sanskrit, Pali, which means uh, wisdom, intelligence. He is the awakened one. The prayer of the Buddha is, may we be awakened from our hypnotic trance of just leading a very mundane, hypnotic life. Therefore, the last words of the Buddha as he was dying was, be a lamp unto yourself. Work out your salvation with diligence. Meaning, on this planet Earth, remember, it is very critical to awaken to your Buddha nature, Christ nature, Allah nature, Elohim nature, Krishna nature. And you've got to do it yourself, this inner inconvenient work. Then you can really be of service to creation. So my dear friends, Blessings to you, be at peace, and allow some of these insights of Buddhism to resonate within you and help you evolve into the fullness of your being. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. To make a donation, head to eastlakecc.com donate.